So after having discussed a few multiple choice questions on ethical principles in dentistry, now we move on to certain case scenarios and case studies, which will give you a better understanding of how to apply these ethical principles and what are the moral guided decisions on the causes of conflict which might arise in this area. Now let's look at some case scenarios here. Now these are actual cases, studies which have been taken from reports across the world. The first case study is of the detached reamer. Now in this claim, the client was elderly and of nervous disposition. She visited her dentist to undergo a root canal treatment on a lower left wisdom tooth. During the course of that treatment, a reamer being used by the defendant, which is the doctor, became detached and fell back onto the tongue. Unfortunately, the client involuntarily swallowed it. The client was taken to a hospital and an x-ray was undertaken, confirming that the instrument or implement had lost in her intestine. Now, surgical intervention was not attempted and a month later, the x-ray examination confirmed that the reamer had actually passed. The client suffered a shock and anxiety as a result of the incident and the client received 2000 euros in full and final settlement for her claim. Now this is an example of actually claims being provided to the patient due to the medical negligence of the doctor. Now in this case, actually what happened was the amount of reasonable care, anything beyond that, okay, the case of the detached reamer was clearly a case of negligence on the part of the doctor. So it violates your principle of to do good and also violates your principle of not doing any kind of harm. So beneficence and maleficence were both being violated in this condition. Because of course this did not lead to any good for the patient but in spite of that or rather despite that there has actually been harm to the patient. So that reamer unfortunately the patient you know, swallowed it and that went and lost into the intestine. However, surgical intervention was not required and finally or rather fortunately the reamer was passed away. Now here in spite of all of these things there was no physical harm to the patient but still the patient suffered a lot of shock and anxiety. So in order to fulfill that there was a compensation which was fixed by the clients you know on the courts on behalf of the patient and had to be paid on, you know paid by the doctors. So this is the case of how you see that there is medical you know, negligence leading you know, to violating of ethical principles where your guided clinical practice should have normally followed which it clearly did not in this case. So you can be given scenarios like this and you might be asked that what are the principles which are applied, what are the principles which are contrasting or conflicting each other or contradicting each other and then you might be asked that what is the remedial or what is the necessary measures to be taken so on and so forth. Okay? So such case scenarios and case studies actually give you a background understanding and understand the perspective better in a clear and elite fashion. So in this particular, you know, any kind of question, whenever you're given a case study, now, okay, now when I talk about this case study, you see the scenario which is given. Now in this scenario one, right, which we talk about the detached reamer. So like I summarized here, the principles which are violated are beneficence and then non-maleficence. Okay, and the compensation is given because the patient suffered actually nervous breakdown and also there was a shock and anxiety. So when you see all these things are happening, this is how a case or any kind of medical negligence case is decided. So we see the intent, of course, this was by accident. So there was no intent for any harm to be done. So this intent was missing and as a result of that, you notice that this lack of intent, so the doctor will not be criminally prosecuted. It happens to be only medical negligence. Then did the patient suffer from any damages? Did this principle of non-maleficence get violated? Yes, the patient had a lot of suffering in terms of the anxiety and the shock. And then there was no change, you know, there was no physical harm, but mental harm also qualifies for medical compensation. So based upon this, the compensation was fixed and then it was awarded. So this is how we have to analyze the scenario which is given to us and then see the ethical principles which are coming into play and then how one will confide unto an other. So moving on with the case studies related to the ethical decision making in dentistry. Now here is a case study too, which deals about the failure to recognize DK. In this case, the client consulted her dentist for the treatment of tooth pain. The dentist failed to recognize the decay in a tooth which demanded prompt treatment. So failure to recognize the decay is the problem here. Now here the failure to treat led to pain and eventually extraction of the tooth which needed to be replaced with an implant retained crown. 
the defendant dentist also unnecessarily extracted a wisdom tooth and removed and replaced a filling. The client received 3,000 euros for damages for pain and suffering, which included an element of future inconvenience as the crown would have to be replaced every seven years. So in this case, if we have to prompt out and write down the details for the case study number two. Here, failure to not recognize tooth decay. Now, detection of tooth decay lies in the reasonable care which is expected from every doctor. Now, failure to diagnose this is when you miss any kind of a lesion which will eventually aggravate. So, the lesion is actually being prevented from going to the next stage if there is early detection. So, here failure is on the part of the doctor which has not performed the reasonable care of duties. So, along with this failure, what actually happened is the pain worsened and that led to the extraction of the tooth and eventually had to be replaced with a kind of abutment. Now, in this kind of abutment kind of retained, that leads to unnecessary expenditure for the patients. This whole sequelae what happens is only because the doctor did not diagnose the dental decay at the initial part. That is the reason why we see in this case that the client ultimately received an amount of 3000 euros as a compensation because even that crown had to be replaced every seven years. So when we notice the ethical principles which are contradicting in this situation is not doing any good is agreed but at the same time doing harm to the patient. So the principle of non-maleficence come into the picture. So doing harm to the patient is leading to aggravated charges which is compounding over the years. Second thing is when you notice that ideally the patient had to be served justice and had to be maintained with the patient's autonomy. So there are other principles which are not applicable here but will be a, some kind of an overarching implication in this case scenario. So you are commonly confronted with such questions in all India entrance examinations and NEET as well. We are actually going to apply the principles of ethics to the relevant examples. So in this we see the compensation which was given about 3000 euros is actually a remedy of compensatory claim which is fixed by the court which had to be paid by the doctor. So this is how we see the case number two failure to recognize tooth decay. Now is another interesting case which is case study three failure to diagnose and treat periodontal disease. So in the previous example what we noticed was the tooth decay leading to eventual pain and extraction of the tooth and then replaced with another crown supported abutment. Here we have the failure to treat periodontal disease. So the implications keep on varying from disease to disease and in a condition like in dental diseases the implications are known to be multifound. Here the client was a 61 year old woman who received 25,000 euros in respect to the dentist's failure to diagnose monitor and treat periodontal disease which led to the loss of multiple teeth and likely future loss of the teeth. The client attended her dentist in the year 1987 and had root canal treatment and crowns fitted and prolonged gum treatment. In she further prolonged gum treatment again in 1989 so the client regularly attended between 1992 to 2006. So we have a span of about 15-16 years in which continuously the treatment charges have been going on. Throughout this period, we see the regular radiographs were being taken repeatedly. Now, these were taken in 2005 to confirm the significant bone loss, which is due to your advanced periodontal destruction. The client bought her case arguing that the dentist failed to use reasonable care and skill in the provision of RCT and in the provision of periodontal treatment from 1987 to 2005. Now the client also argued that the dentist failed to use reasonable skill and care and monitor the progression of the dental disease on here it is about periodontal conditions and failure to use such reasonable care and skill in recording the relevant periodontal indices. So this is a classical example where you don't detect periodontal disease at the initial stage you are actually compounding it and repeatedly you are worsening the condition which requires the patient to go more into more with the vulnerable population. So this is how that your failure to diagnose also qualifies into your scenario. So in case study number where we are talking about periodontal disease we notice that the initial bone loss followed by the pocket depth which are radiographically visible taken routinely because of the repeated appointments. All of these add as your evidence. So when you have evidence that this thing was not being identified at multiple and subsequent visits, it tends to be a part of medical negligence on behalf of the doctor. So the doctor is actually you know, liable to be prosecuted and the claims which are being rightfully given here, an amount of 25,000 euros to the patient eventually to make sure that the compensation is done in some kind of a 
monetary method. So this is another classical example where the patient is actually dealt by causing harm to the patient by not doing something also. So we have to understand in clinical situations, there will be situations which will come out of this and as they say that as a result of circumstance is your consequence. So consequences have to be borne and eventually the patient will suffer and the cost will be burdened upon on the doctor. So this is how one leads to another and eventually the whole story of epidontal disease being not diagnosed has happened in this case. So this is a classical example of how you understand and I'm sure you would have been you know, quite familiar now by giving these case scenarios. So you might encounter such application based questions as well in the examination. Next, we have a very simple uh, case study which talks about Hira's dilemma. Now, Hira is a 15-year-old boy whose first molar is decayed and requires root canal treatment. Now, Hira's father, Vira, wants the tooth to be extracted as he cannot afford the treatment. Now, he also cannot travel for long distance for treatment and will lose out on his daily wages. However, Hira does not want the tooth to be extracted. He is also apprehensive over the extraction procedure. So, what is your plan of action? Explain the reasoning for your action. What are the principles of ethics and what are the types of consent? Now, these are all the possible questions which were emanating or emerging from your situation here. So, 15-year-old boy whose molar is decayed has to go for an RCT. Now, this is the recommended judicious decision of the doctor recommended to the patient. But the patient's father here says that the tooth has to be extracted because he cannot afford the treatment. And he cannot go for repeated visits. As, as we know, root canal treatment requires repeated visits that again will lose out his daily wages. So here, normally what would be a plan of action? What is the reasoning? So we have to justify. If we have recommended a certain plan of action, we have to justify saying that why this is applicable and why we think this is the situation. Finally, we have to list out the principles of ethics. So when we notice all these questions, we notice what are to be answered first and second and all of this subsequently. So here, like they say, what would be your plan of action? Then there'll be a justification. And then we have to list out the principles and eventually we have to notice what will be the type of consent. So here, if at all you're supposed to take consent, what kind of consent does that qualify? So in legal terminologies, whether informed consent is applicable or express consent or verbal consent or assent, all of these things would be dealt here. So when you look at all these things, you also need to know the historical developments and ethical principles and circumstances where consent is not applicable. So this is a case scenario which kind of summarizes your whole topics of ethics. Now let's look at the answer keys here. Now for Hira's dilemma, what actually we're looking at is the dilemma is arising due to the ability for decision making. Okay, So we have to apply the principles of ethics. Whichever is applied in whichever context, we notice that these are all the things. Now, the principles of ethics, quick revision is to do no harm, which is non-maleficence. To do good is beneficence. Respect for persons, justice, veracity or truthfulness, confidentiality and fidelity. Now, the types of consent, like I said, there are various consent types like implied, which is tacit consent. There is express consent, that is informed and then there is proxy consent. Now, implied consent, one by one, let me just explain this briefly to you. Implied consent is when the doctor is actually in his clinic or in his hospital, the patient walks in and sits on the chair. So they have implied, they're giving the consent for you to examine, all right, or for you to do some kind of a investigation at the preliminary level. Now, like I said, again, examination only is given by implied consent. Express consent is when the patient himself tells it out, okay, or expresses that, doctor, please look into the teeth or please look into the gums and what has happened, let me know. All of these things are dealt. Informed consent is a combination which is very important here, be it the Nuremberg Code which brought in informed consent, where all the repercussions, right, everything, you know, uh, related to the treatment, the pros, the cons, the benefits, the risk, uh, the procedure, how it will be carried forward, why are we doing this, all of that are packaged and given as a document called informed consent, which is the most important. Then proxy consent usually is called a substitute consent, where if the patient is not in a condition to consent, okay, maybe probably in an emergency condition, or when the patient is a minor, where the parents can give consent below the certain age of 13 or 14 years, accordingly, this is applicable. Historical developments, quickly if you see, okay, right from what everybody is familiar with is the Hippocratic Oath. Now, Hippocratic Oath, as all of us, we take, we solemnly swear, right? We say that whatever we do in the interest of your patients, that we will do good, we will keep them, prioritize them above everybody else, all of that. The legislations, like I mentioned previously, Nuremberg Code in the year 1947, 
the Geneva Declaration in 48, which laid down the human rights regulation, the World Medical Association started off with the Code of Medical Ethics in 1949, the Helsinki in 1964 and eventually 66, and the ICMR guidelines which are presently applicable right now. The Indian Council of Medical Research has given out ethical guidelines for biomedical research on human participants. So from 1980 till as recent as 2020, they have been revised continuously and new additions have been made. Now, there are circumstances, you will need to know this as well, because this could be framed as a question where they give you the statement, say, they, where consent is not applicable. So, consent need not be obtained is in case of medical emergency, notifiable diseases, okay, and in case of outbreaks and all of this which happens. So, you notify the diseases, you're actually notifying the authorities and you're making a note of the outbreak. In case of immigrants, armed forces, handlers of food and dairy men, new admission to prisons or when there's a court order or a criminal prosecution proceedings against the person. So you do not need consent in these kind of situations. So there is an exception in the law for these circumstances only. So we notice these are the brief gist of ethical decision making or ethical principles in dentistry which have to be applied to a multitude of situations. Okay. So like I said, you need to know the principles of ethics. You need to know what each of them mean. What are the statements which are governing them? They need to know the historical background and then you need to be able to justify your action. So when you're applying the appropriate statements or you know questions where there's application basis, where they give you a scenario like what we've discussed, you must be applying which rule or which principle of ethic has been violated, which can be condoned, which is contradictory, which can be you know confronting or conflicting with one another. All of these kind of questions can normally arise. So this is how you actually address the whole topic of ethics. And that is a brief understanding of the topic of ethics. Thank you.